Hey guys, it's Blockchain Brad and today I'm very honoured to speak about an exciting blockchain project called Unibright. And to explain this further, we have the CEO and the CTO. So firstly, we have Martin Jung. And as I said, he is the founder and head of blockchain development representing Unibright. Thank you very much for your time today. Thanks for having us. It's an honour. And Thanks. likewise, thank you very much for coming on, on board to the channel, Martin. And also we have Stefan Schmidt. He is the CTO, and we're going to find out about his background soon, uh, very soon. But obviously, I want to welcome you to the channel as well, Stefan. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So Unibright, that is the topic of the moment and of the day. And essentially, their slogan is to be the unified framework for blockchain-based business integration. Quite a mouthful, a lot to unpack today. Um, but what better to do than understand exactly what the credentials are of these two gentlemen. So firstly, Martin, can you tell us a bit about yourself? You have a master's degree, you have 20 years experience in, in business modelling, I mean, impressively the SAP integration system experience, but tell us exactly why you are well fit for the CEO position. Yeah, that, that's right. Um, Stefan and me share a lot of uh, our history. Um, we joined together when we were very young. We studied together and we built up our first uh, enterprise in 2004. We developed um, software for bigger companies. Um, we did a lot of business integration, um, mostly with SAP systems. Uh, we developed uh, small ERP systems on our own. We integrated mobile devices when they came up, did a lot of um, web services when they came up. So we are, were always up with new technology and had companies to make use of it. So we went on and in uh, 2011, um, we set up our own integration platform, so to say. It's our first product that's uh, running since 2011 with bigger companies, with the fifth biggest German bank, for example, and it integrates their SAP system, their ERP system, with the system of their suppliers. So we integrate the supply chain, we are exchanging orders and getting back delivery notes and so on. I see. And so, this so essentially, yeah. Martin, sorry to interrupt, but you have industry experience, which we like to hear. Not only that, but specifically to do with platform experience that relates to what we'll be talking about today. So that's great. And thank you for that yes. recap of, of your work history. Now, Stefan, obviously you are impressive as well in that you have a similar number of years of experience with 20. Uh, you also have business modeling experience and specifically software development knowledge. Uh, and experience in the workplace. So tell us a bit about yourself, Stefan, and, and why you're so well situated to be the supporting CTO. Yeah, uh, as Martin already put it, uh, we share a lot of com common histories. So we did our studies together and a lot of work together. So I think to, to be completely in the picture, of course, we have um, the CEO and the CTO uh, speaking here, but uh, we also have the two founders speaking here. Mm -hmm. We have two wow. friends speaking here, and uh, we are both completely in the picture of what each other uh, is doing. So uh, when it comes to the technical perspective, for example, Martin could uh, just serve as well as I could because we share um, the same experience from projects we did and also common uh, development uh, mm -hmm. techniques. Uh, but when it comes to strategic decisions, we also share our thoughts and are just two founders. So uh, I would not divide us too much uh, in these two parts of being the CEO and the CTO. We both share the same uh, vision mm -hmm. on the project, on the market, and also on the potential of our platform. Sure, and we're going to explore your vision certainly later, and we appreciate that you 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 have such unified stance on in your project. That's always a good stand, uh, starting point. But let's explore now some of the problems that you foresaw in the centralized and legacy space of enterprise and business. Obviously, that's your key focus focus right now. So we'll start with you, Martin, as the CEO. What are some of the issues you saw that you really wanted to touch base with using blockchain? Yeah. Okay. First of all, I would like to say something to integration because it's something that is very important for us. Looking at blockchain, you can see blockchain in an isolated way. It's always about integration because companies, they've got existing system landscapes and they are already there and they will stay um, with or without blockchain. So it's about integration mm -hmm. of different systems and of integration, integration of blockchain into the systems. And when we look at blockchain, it's it's a very unique um, technology that brings features that aren't here already. But to be honest, these features, you can use them perfectly well in, in, in a lot of uh, use cases, a lot of templates for many business processes, but not for all of them. Mm -hmm. And that's why we came up with a framework where we can tell the company or the user, here are use cases, and we uh, put them into templates 
where you can use blockchain technology. You can set up like an approval process or a tracing process. You can set up a insurance claim process. All these templates we um, defined and we can use them in our framework as a basis to start using blockchain technology. I so see. It's not about, yeah. Sorry. Okay, so obviously you want to be the bridge. So Stefan, if I said to you a suggestion or some slogans, could you just comment on these? So if you were perhaps the bringing together blockchain and traditional business, if I said that you are making business smarter, literally utilizing the concept of smart contracts, and then finally if I said that you are the business gateway in, the, in a decentralized fashion, are we on track? Yes, we are on track and I think it's also an additional role that we have right now of course, we are offering a framework and we want to uh, we want to present our solution to potential customers or right now to investors during the token launch. But what we also do is to bring the knowledge about the new technology into uh, the enterprises, mm -hmm. because for some of all of them um, have a different feeling what blockchain is for some of them. Blockchain is just a synonym for cryptocurrencies. For some of them, blockchain is more about the technology mm -hmm. and also for some of them on management level, perhaps blockchain is more like a buzzword or a trend that they have to keep up with before uh, their competitors do. And what we, we are not only integrating blockchain into enterprises on a technical level, but also on the know-how level to explain, like Martin put it, where does blockchain make sense and where does it bring something new to the picture? But we are not those ones who, who go out and tell um, all the companies, they should switch off their existing system because blockchain will do everything. Mm -hmm. That's just not the reality. So we are both an enabler in the technical space, but also in the know-how space. I see. Well, let's explore now the fundamentals. If we could look at it as an overview concept. If someone approached you in the street and they said, could you tell us in a nutshell what essentially Unibright was? Martin, what would you say to that? Yeah, it depends on how short it should be. In one <laughs> sentence, we bring... <laughs> yeah, it's a technology. tough call, hence we say nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> in one sentence, uh, we, bring uh, we bring blockchain technology into the enterprise world. Mm -hmm. Our Unibright framework, we allow companies um, to set alive business processes that make use of blockchain technology. And we do this with predefined templates mm -hmm. where you don't start um, at scratch. You can say, I've got an approval process, and you pick that template, you visually define and adjust your process, put in all the systems, put in your logic, and then we generate the smart contracts that are needed. We generate the adapters to connect the different systems involved in the process, and we generate a business intelligence view, which is very important, but often forgotten, a central um, dashboard where you can see all the information flowing between the systems and the business process, so we um, empower the whole business process lifecycle from defining, setting alive, maintaining it, uh, and viewing it. I see. Yeah, and so, so, sorry, go ahead. Can I add, uh, this, that's why we call it unifying, um, because basically what, what we try to explain mm -hmm. to companies is focus on what you're actually good at. Focus at your processes or at your core business. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want to make use of this new technology, then use a unifying framework where you can stay on your process level as long as possible and then have all technical objects that are needed generated automatically. That's, yes. that's our core yeah. sentence yeah. towards selling our solution to, to enterprises. I see. And I think the key word you said there was solution. So, gentlemen, let's explore this concept of integration a little further in that you are obviously proposing some sort of software, some proprietary software, which we'll explore that facilitates this integration. But in the context of blockchain, what I wanted to make clear to all the audience through you is what is specifically the role of blockchain? Obviously, you are focused on blockchain businesses for the future, but essentially you are not a blockchain itself by any means. No, 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 we are not a blockchain. We are an integration framework and a code generation framework or an object generation framework. So our idea is to be blockchain agnostic. Mm -hmm. We focus more on the process view of things and um, the user of our framework can focus uh, on the process as well, can um, define it and customize it visually and decide for a specific implementation later. Mm -hmm. And our idea to do so is not because we couldn't decide for our favorite blockchain or anything. We just believe that in terms of infrastructure and new protocols coming up, the market is still uh, evolving very fast. Mm -hmm. But uh, on enterprise side, very fast, to be very fast sometimes means uh, taking weeks or even months to set up a process. And uh, we want to give them uh, the, the option to um, 
already start their process and define it, mm -hmm. and then perhaps decide for another blockchain implementation uh, nine months from now, for example. Mm -hmm. So we are not a, an own blockchain. We are a framework that is able to target as uh, all blockchains as long as they offer some basic concepts in code of, uh, in terms of their smart contract. Data. I see. So, so Martin, if you could just extend this a little bit more. You mentioned this before with regard to your your software framework, in the context that you are essentially a one stop shop for uh, any businesses, legacy included, that are considering using blockchain. But there are four components to that design. You, can you tell us a bit about that? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, at first, as I told you, there are these templates, which are the starting point of our framework. And you can take them into our designer and you can visually then design your process as a company. You can do it on a process level because it's a little insight. Our customers told us and we know they don't want to code smart contracts because they, they don't want to do it and they don't, don't have the resources to do it. Mm -hmm. So what we offer them is a visual tool where they can visually define their logic in a, let's say, workflow design builder. Mm -hmm. They can adjust the logic, put in the systems. And that's blockchain agnostic. They do it in a logical way and they can store those. And the second tool would be the lifecycle manager where we can generate out of those workflows, we can generate the blockchain specific smart contract, for example, having all that logic and put it into a blockchain. We can maintain it later on if it has to be changed. Mm -hmm. And we generate the smart adapters, um, which we need for our integration platform to connect the different systems. And we got the Explorer component. That's what I um, meant with business intelligence view. Mm -hmm. It's the one-stop dashboard where you see all the information in the business process going on. I see. These, these are the visually oriented tools. And of course, you have to see our integration platform. Mm -hmm. I mentioned it in the introduction. It's running since 2011. It's our, ready, it's our product that is already working, productive. We enhanced it that's, so that it's able to connect technically to blockchains. So we just put in new adapters, let's say for Ethereum, mm -hmm. and now we can um, connect an SAP system to an Ethereum smart contract. I see. Yeah, of, <clears throat> of course, it would be easier to understand the four tools with a, with a visual um, support. So mm -hmm. to, to have it very short, um, the workflow designer is for uh, designing a process visually. The lifecycle manager is for generating objects automatically. Mm -hmm. The explorer is for keeping track of the complete process in a visual way, and the connector is bringing together existing systems and the smart contracts. I see. So let's talk about this now in terms of its proprietary nature. Obviously, gentlemen, you are wanting to build out some sort of enterprise yourselves or business. So what is the nature of this with regard to closed source, open source? Obviously, you're focused on service and product. Yeah, perhaps I, I can have some details on this. Um, as Martin said, the connecting part, so the actual integration platform, uh, no matter if it's blockchain or not, uh, is an up and running product. So mm -hmm. this part is not uh, open source. The, the, the code is 100% licensed to us, so we can, we can use it, but it's not open source since it's uh, serving productive customers, uh, for example, from the banking sector. Mm -hmm. But the most important and the, the really exciting part of our framework is when it comes to smart contract generation. And we will uh, and have to be very open about that because our argument is um, you are an enterprise, you shouldn't go for uh, hiring one specific uh, blockchain developer because mm -hmm. perhaps you do not know, is it a good developer or not? Is he the one who decides for the right implementation? Perhaps he likes Solidity, but Ethereum would not be the perfect blockchain to go for your use case. Right. So, of course, our templates and the, the code generation engine and also the basic code that comes with the template will be uh, audited and proven by us, also by third uh, party institutions, and also, of course, will be made uh, public for everyone to check mm -hmm. uh, to see that the level and the um, quality of code we provide by um, automatic generation will easily uh, um, be better than uh, those hacked by someone who bought his first uh, Solidity tutorial, mm -hmm. and perhaps does mistakes that, that are really uh, yeah, painful when it comes to smart contract because you just can't do a short update and everything is running again. You have to be really <coughs> secure about what you're doing. Sure, obviously. So obviously having that agnostic position is, it certainly puts you in good stead because it allows you to access not just current blockchain designs but certainly those in the future that tend to be more parallel scaling or multi-chain designs as we're seeing some emerge now. But yeah, there, are okay. some, there are some claims <coughs> excuse me, that you have made in your, your statements both online and in your white paper. 
And one of them is that you argue that you are the groundbreaking uh, visually definable platform. So Martin, can you explain to us what that actually means? It's quite a unique term yeah. that you've coined. Yeah, the unique point is that if you kick in at the process level, as we call it, mm -hmm. it's the, the, the interface, the connection between our customers and us as a technically as a, as a provider of, of blockchain technology. We allow the companies, the enterprises to stay on the business process level where they are, where they know what they want, where they are good at. And for example, they are, they are good in doing things in their domain like brewing beer or producing jewelry, and right. they are good in telling us how their processes look like, but they are not good at, let's say, coding a smart contract mm -hmm. or coding, I don't know, some integration between systems. And so we allow them to stay in that business process uh, level and have this visually, visually oriented tools where they can define everything and we generate the objects needed. And, and mm -hmm. one thing I wanted to add about code generation is it's about the quality standard. What we aim to do is, especially for enterprise usage, we want to set up some um, quality level there. Because when we audit these smart contracts and the generated code, um, then we can offer some um, quality here um, where, which, on which uh, companies can rely. We have got uh, people that do nothing but um, check software and do tests. And the, the idea is to have them some standard in uh, smart contract coding too, because it's very vital to not have some errors um, in, in some smart contracts that go live. I see. That's another point you have to keep in mind when talking about code generation. Right, and obviously with both your, your experience and no doubt your team, standardizing some sort of, uh, like, uh, I guess, framework specifically to do that is going to be imperative for the, you know, the standards or essentially the high level of service that you want to provide. But let's now, I wanted to talk about Microsoft just for a moment. I understand it is one of your partners, but I wanted to really use this as, as an analogy with regard to Windows, because obviously Windows is a software, it's a, it's a mechanism as a service. So is that a fair analogy to compare that to the kind of things you want to do? in that people are going to access something to utilize and, and benefit from uh, in the real world of business. I think that's a very high level um, co comparison. When in, in our terms, when it comes to Microsoft, it's more about their development frameworks. So uh, I think if you uh, think of something like the .NET framework, which offers you um, different programming languages, to be targeting different systems, for example, a web application or a server application, a mobile application, then uh, this is more the terms of framework that we think to have uh, different entry points mm -hmm. and different possible outputs, but all based on one uh, unifying um, technology that takes all these aspects together in one package. So when it comes to Microsoft, I would rather compare us to the .NET framework mm -hmm. than to the to an operating system. Okay, well, yeah. thanks, for, thanks for making yeah. that clear. But the, certainly yeah, yeah. you are purchasable in the risk with respect to, imagine I'm the business and you are the provider. Certainly there's gonna be a system in place where I, I have to pay a fee via use of the token to you know uh, be, become part of your network. Is that correct? Yeah. Or, or yeah. Uh, do I pay for the do I pay to become part of the network or do I do I pay for a service or a product? Yeah, you pay for the use of the uh, of the service. So even our our software itself, our software solution will be free to use. So you don't pay uh, like for a, for a new software that you have uh, to mm -hmm. to license on I don't know on on uh, computer base or on developer base or something, you can just use the tools. But as soon as the, the outcome of our tools, so a generated smart contract, for example, does something like connecting to an existing SAP system, mm -hmm. then this is uh, charged uh, by Unibright tokens. And our business model, model is just comparable to the one we have with our existing integration platform. Mm -hmm. We want to set up an integration process once because if integration works, as soon as it works, it most probably will work for months or even for years. Mm -hmm. So it's totally okay if you put a little bit more of your own effort into the development, but then have a long-term income out of the transaction that are based on this integration process. I see. So obviously you are using blockchain more so for the benefit of the business that is coming to you uh, to explore the possibilities. So I wanted to ask you fundamentally, you know, if someone came up to you and said, why use a blockchain? What would you say to that if they assumed that you were somehow using one? Because often, we get, yes, 
why you mean why to, why to use blockchain in general as a as a company or as, yes. as, a, as a private it, person? What, what can we do with blockchain what exactly. couldn't be done before particularly with regard to better? particularly with regard to efficiency profitability those kinds of things yeah efficiency the first thing that comes that came into my mind was about transparency here um, we work for let me give you an example we work for a german brewery or for a few of them and then there was a law which uh, forced the breweries to make transparent their production process to show which ingredients came from which suppliers and how they were used and mixed up in batches and so on mm -hmm. and um, we did these processes a few years ago with a centralized database where we stored all this data and uh, we built up some some views how to pull the data together and so on and now we um, set up a pilot project where we did all this with a blockchain with a public blockchain because the aim was now to give the, the end consumer some transparent and reliable um, source where they can look into and see the production process of the bottle of beer that was produced. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea was to use a public blockchain and write into it the, the process of um, factoring the beer, um, mixing it up, using all the ingredients. And so it's about a few food safety here um, using a public blockchain. I see. So that's just one example. Yeah, that's it's one yeah, of our okay. templates, our tracing templates, by the way. And there are other templates for, let's say, a private blockchain, um, which which brings new benefits too, like connecting um, entities from, let's say, Far East. We had this with um, with a company here in Germany because they didn't want the um, suppliers in Far East to access the ERP system. So we, we used a private blockchain as a communication channel, so to say, um, for them to set up an approval process. I see. Yeah, I, I think this the second example is not so um, not so much about transparency, but another buzzword like uh, having this trustless trust. And I think this is uh, uh, as as we are talking about smart contract generation. Of mm -hmm. course, the smart contracts are a vital part of our. Yeah, of our solution and also uh, in our understanding what blockchain really is is good for. Right. And we think right. um, if, if you think of an unsafe market where you would have to put up classic contracts, old school contracts yeah. written by lawyers mm -hmm. in different jurisdictions uh -huh. yeah. using different languages and uh, they cost a lot of money. And still, uh, even if this contract would exist uh, saying how how can I exchange data with my supplier in Far East? then you still would have to trust the IT company or the IT department of the other party exactly doing what's written in the contract. Right. So the nice thing right. about blockchain yeah. and the smart contract is that the smart contract is actually doing the work and it's much easier for different jurisdictions to rely on a part of code, as at least it's possible because they could understand or it's mm. audited, then understand like... Uh, a book of contracts written in thousand paragraphs by lawyers, which language nobody understands. Mm -hmm. So for me, this is the killer feature of blockchain to yeah. enable trustless trust scenarios. Sure. So yeah, that, that automation is key. But gentlemen, I wanted to ask you this because I was hoping you would allude to money. Because obviously, at the end of the day, businesses want to make more money. And if they can do this better using blockchain, surely you're going to have a much wider client base. So can we talk about that in terms of profitability for a moment? Does it have the potential to provide better profits than maintaining their current existing models? Of yeah. course so, yeah. and on, on very different levels, I think. Mm. Okay, yeah, and, and per, per, yeah, perhaps not in a very direct way, but more in an indirect way, like, like as I put it, like setting new features alive that mm -hmm. weren't there. Uh, when I think about it, it's not about gaining efficiency uh, so much. It's much more about um, building up something that wasn't possible before like this transparency example I, I just stated. Mm. It's it's offering um, features that weren't there before, which other competitors don't have. And in that way, you can uh, run ahead of your competitor as a, as a company uh, when using new technology. But it's always the same with new technology. Uh, they bring you features and um, the first ones to use these features might uh, have some profit of it. Sure. Yes, and, and I think I think blockchain at least has the potential to to gain profit not only by saving money because you make some uh, something more efficient. Um, the example with replacing two lawyers with a smart contract, of course, will save will save money, and then yeah. perhaps you will be able to gain more profit. But uh, blockchain has really the potential uh, to add value to something. So the the example Martin did with the 
uh, brewery uh, bringing can transparency to the to their customers mm -hmm. in in the first uh -huh. step this only will cost money because they have to set up a new process they have to um, think of a new technology they have to use a framework like unibright hopefully but in the end they gain competitive advantage over other breweries who are not that transparent right. so uh, we finally have a technology that's not only working for itself like virtualization or cloud mm -hmm. and the consumer uh -huh. doesn't know if it's a new technology or not but it really brings value to the complete process and that's uh, the biggest potential in uh, in long term okay well okay. let's explore now the token yeah. itself trying to understand its its purpose its function because obviously what we see the propensity for ICOs is that they have some sort of utility built in so can you tell us Martin what is the specific utility, given that you are essentially a, you know, a, a software design, a provision for businesses, what is the purpose of your token? Yeah, first of all, it is a utility token, and it's, so to say, the fuel for our framework. We like to see it, the picture like it is a voucher for doing transactions. Mm -hmm. As Stefan already stated, uh, every time we do a transaction or connect, let's say, an SAP system with a smart contract and call a transaction or a function there, then a small amount of Unibright tokens um, has to be paid for this. I see. And so, yeah. So as a voucher, are the, are the predominant users your clients? Yes, of course. Yeah. Okay, so we, when we talk about it in the context of what we tend to see in the blockchain space right now, there's a lot of people purchasing tokens for, you know, their assumed investment value initially, certainly, but no doubt many of them are utility by design or perhaps not. But if someone is purchasing that, you know, with the mindset of investment, and then you couple that with the utility of the client using that, where does it fit in for the person purchasing it? You know, the lay person who is not using it as a client. No, of course. Um, uh, generally speaking, we will not give any investment proposals here. I think from a legal st uh, standpoint, you understand. Yes. But uh, if you think of a, of a token launch and an ICO as a, a crowdfunding instrument, mm. then um, mm. it's totally clear that when you aim for a future technology, that we, our, our mission statement is to bring blockchain to enterprises. Um, so if it, were, if it would be already there, then nobody would need something like Unibride. Um, and that's the reason that companies and enterprises are not that far as the early adopters of the crypto space are. Mm -hmm. But what we are doing is we give them the chance to hold vouchers for a future use of companies. So companies will need to have this utility to use the platform, mm -hmm. but it's for us easier to explain it right now in these days to the early adopters in crypto space because they watch videos like yours right or they right. Uh, they dive deep into different technologies different blockchains and they know what's going on and it's totally fair from our view to have these early adopters somehow honored and to offer them uh, our vouchers so they can give it to the customers uh, that will actually use the platform later mm -hmm. um, and and uh -huh. It's also very important in terms of Unibride that we are not talking about um, giving a token out in our crowd sale on Friday, say, and uh, expect any gain from it on Saturday. It's a mid or long term um, project because uh, companies still need this knowledge transfer to really get into the space. But yeah. if they are there, they want to use our platform, they will need the utility. Token. Yeah, so to, to give you sorry. Some, to, to, sorry, to give you some insight, um, for example, looking at our seed investors, um, they are aiming for using the utility too, because they they are seed yeah. investors because mm. they want to use the framework and they want to use the token, and that's why they already purchased the token to use it to use the framework to set up something in quotes with blockchain technology and existing systems. So I think that's a strong argument on on how the token uh, will be used. Absolutely. I just want to clarify though for all those who are in that interim space who are not the seed investor and they have gone and purchased or continuing considering purchasing that obviously and they are not going to be the clients so the the concept in that respect is that it's a value proposition for that person and let's be clear with that it isn't a utility but they are aware that as your uh, your uh, ecosystem grows uh, no doubt the token value will grow and 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 obviously the your own uh, you know profitability and size of the company so no doubt that's what they're thinking you would imagine because yes, then they're, they're not the clients themselves. Of course, and that's that's why we also look at both perspectives. Yeah, because we we wouldn't offer a B two B token in a public token launch if if we wouldn't think of both sides. Yeah? Right. Then we wouldn't be good uh, entrepreneurs. Mm. So our idea 
from the customer side is they want to have them some price stability. They um, they want to know if they set up a um, transaction or an integration process now, they want to use it for two years, then they want to have a feeling about it. What will what will it cost in two years so, so they can budget it? Sure. And the investor uh, from his side, of course, will see the potential that the, uh, the value he invested or he contributed is somehow stable or at least having the possibility to evolve. Mm -hmm. um, and so our idea is that as soon as a customer wants to use the token, he has to get it from the market and bring it into the platform. And it will stay in the platform for as long as the customer is using the product. And of course, we will do our very best to provide such a high quality that many customers want to use it for long term. Mm -hmm. And so that's the value position for the token. The more customers will use it, the more tokens stay in the platform. And if a new customer um, appears, then he has to get tokens from the market. Sure. So it's a fair sure. deal uh, for both the early adopters, but also for the long-term users of the token. I see. So they, they really do uh, envisage or envision uh, this your company to really grow into something quite profitable. That's the whole pre uh, premise for them to consider it as a utility uh, consideration. So, gentlemen, if we could talk now about your pre-existing company and what you've done before this with SPO. Martin, could you tell us a bit about that and why that is so imperative to the overall architecture? Yeah, SPO is, is a consulting company and a software developing company and it's 100% in the, let's say, SAP or, or ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning software world. Mm -hmm. So what we did the last uh, 10, 15, or I think it's more than 15 years, uh, is going to big companies and helping them set alive business processes in different sectors. We were developing software in SAP directly, mm -hmm. or we were integrating other systems, or we were uh, putting into some mobile devices, or we were doing like, I don't know, web services to connect to legacy systems. All of this, it's it's the distinction, it's it's business systems, it's business software, it's, it's not consumer software, it's the uh, software that uh, big enterprises use and SAP as a leader was always the main focus of, of SPO and we are offering and offered in the last 15 plus years um, services, software development and consulting um, in that in that sector. I see. Yeah. So Stefan, could you help me out and understand this a bit further with regard to a comparison with let's say Hashgraph. So Hashgraph have a company behind them called Swirls who essentially are like a parent, parent company that support it. Is that much the same with your with SPO in that it's a spin-off of some kind? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think I think the role of SPO uh, is more like um, being one of the one of the partners that we have in our complete portfolio. Mm -hmm. The the oh. the uh, special the special thing about SPO is that Martin and me uh, are also part of the leaderboard of SPO, and that the remaining persons of the SPO leaderboard are also advisors to Unibright. Right. Um, but SPO holds no shares in Unibright. Unibright is a dedicated, it's more like a know-how spin-off. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we also could have run this under SPO, obviously, but um, you know it better than everybody else. Crypto mm -hmm. uh, world is moving very fast. And when right. we started this like one year ago, it was totally unclear how um, regulation will evolve, for example, in Germany. Mm -hmm. And we did not want to bring a new product into a company that's there since 1989. And perhaps half a year the, later, the German regulatory would decide all blockchain projects have to stop immediately. Mm -hmm. And then we would have a basic problem with SPO. So um, right now uh, that we are moving really forward concerning regulatory aspects, that we are uh, quite uh, compliant, understand utility and what a security is, sure. it would have sure. usually be done under SPO but it was not the case one year ago. So right mm -hmm. now the situation is that SPO is just one of our uh, partner consultings just as Zürcher is and also as Microsoft Germany. Is. So it's more right. about the partner than one dedicated um, uh, company. I see. Thank you for making that clear. And obviously you also answered a question about making sure you're legally compliant. It's obviously something that <clears throat> certainly is in 
in your mindset at all times to make sure that yeah. you continue in the future. Yeah. So Martin, it's not it's not only on our mindset, but <laughs> we totally underestimated that it yeah. would make more than half of our daily work these these months. We we would love to focus on the. We can assure you, we are, we are compliant. We can assure you that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We, and, yeah. And we did lots of work for that. Yeah. And let's be honest. I mean, you being German yourselves, you've got a good track record just from your own race. I mean, you've got an outstanding uh, track record of, of efficiency of performance in, in many respects. I mean. Yeah, so we would have assumed, I think many people in the world, that you would have been focusing on that. But it, um, Martin, if we could talk about now use cases with regard to your, uh, just an example, <clears throat> given that you have a life cycle, you know, it, a, a advertised in your white paper, if you could give us one example of how a business of any kind in any industry could actually go through the process of, you know, utilizing your service, what would it be and how, how would you portray it? Yeah, in a, in a brief description, it would be, like uh, running through our templates and find the template that matches the need. Like um, let's say they want to set up an approval process because they um, develop some, I don't know, some part of jewelry here in Germany. They design it in Germany, but they have to approve it um, with the um, supplier who produces the jewelry in Far East because they have to get the samples from there, talk about the quality mm -hmm. and all this. Uh, we've seen this process going on with writing emails and sending Excel files along. And so this is a process we um, enable with our template to make use of blockchain technology. So the idea would be they select the um, template for the approval process. They go into the visual oriented framework. They adjust the, the, the process and the workflow designer. And then they push some buttons. We generate the smart contract that is needed. Mm -hmm. um, we generate the adapters to connect their ERP system to the smart contract. Uh, and then they are more than ready to set the approval process alive mm -hmm. and um, can trigger from their ERP system. They can then um, work with the new jewelry and the approval process can be triggered in the ERP system, then goes down into the blockchain, into the smart contract, changes some state there and then it's, let's say, up to the supplier in Far East to deliver a new um, product, a new sample, and to set a flag or a status in the smart contract, which then is um, represented in the ERP system. I see. So that's the so idea it's about setting up the process. So it's obviously a very complex process, and that's essentially what yeah. your company is banking on. You're relying on that being complicated, so people need you as a service and as a, a conduit between yeah. themselves and you know, their own uh, business an enterprise. But gentlemen, I wanted to ask you about something going on with some companies right now in the blockchain domain, whereby perhaps in the future, de specific developing languages will not be required in the sense that part of your design is that you are going to facilitate the unpacking and exploration and even locating of certain developing languages that do suit the needs of your clients. But there are some that are suggesting that natural language approaches through AI are going to emerge and that they will gradually make it facilitate for a much more seamless uh, client oh, yeah. right through to application the process, whereby they could even potentially circumvent something like yourselves. What do you say to that? Is it even possible? Uh, yes, I, I think it's, it's possible. But on the other hand, I also have to laugh a little bit because uh, uh, we've been told so 20 years ago. And to give you the not so romantic insight on reality is that when it comes to enterprise software, you're still sometimes you're still dealing with FTP service. Right. So of course, because we have uh, like artif uh, artificial intelligence coming up and serving like natural language interfaces. Mm -hmm. But uh, if these will be so um, how to say so implemented uh, that you really can replace existing software, will be more a matter of decades than of months or years. Uh, so our integration approach is very yeah. reality driven. Yeah, yeah. We, we saw many new technologies coming and still uh, it's not that the new technology wiped the old one away, but it somehow has to be integrated with the working world and the existing systems. And we think uh, there is a, a certain amount of time where it still will be very feasible to use mm -hmm. like a structured programming language besides the artificial uh, natural language interfaces that may arise. I see. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't have said it better, Stefan. You're talking about reality versus the dream of the future. So let's now talk exactly. about your tokenomics in that <clears throat> obviously people would under, like to understand what your utility represents. So what's the plan in terms of your distribution uh, and essentially for the UBT and uh, what can people expect at the moment? 
Yes, uh, we we have um, the token distribution uh, mm -hmm. um, explained uh, on our on our website in our white paper and also in our block entries when it comes to updates. So, mm -hmm. for example, in the very beginning, we were not um, sure uh, if we should do a dedicated pre-sale or not. Mm -hmm. But then mm -hmm. uh, we we did so to serve the, the the early adopters by whitelisting and so on. Sure. Uh, so, fr from distribution uh, standpoint, I can. Um, Give you give you some numbers if you. Well, if you for want example, to if we focus just on your private, your public sale rather, that's coming up very soon. So, what kind of percentages yeah. are we thinking about, or what have you allocated for the public sale? Yeah, it's. Um, okay. well, I can help you, you out. It's uh, it's sixty seven percent approximately. Yeah. So you're looking yeah. at a hundred, just over a hundred million tokens, <clears throat> which is you know in comparison to other blockchain. Uh, ICO uh, presentations, it's not something that's unsurprising. But I wanted to ask you more to the point, <clears throat> what is your plan in terms of the other parts of the tokens? Are, are you planning out on research and development? You know, how are you going to sustain your growth? Okay, so from a, from, from a usage, I, I think we, we should divide mm -hmm. what, what the token allocations so far are. So for example, we have seed funding tokens sure. um, that were all, already uh, used for a seed funding round in November of last year. Yeah. Um, we had some, uh, we have some tokens allocated for ad advisors. We have tokens allocated and locked for one year for the team. Mm -hmm. And we have this, what we call public sale, but also part of the public sale was the pre-sale that's already done. Mm -hmm. And right now we are in the process of opening up uh, to US accredited investors. Uh, and as they have to use another software for contributing than the rest of the world, it might also be that we have to allocate some tokens for this dedicated market. I see. Um, and the other thing, how, how, do, how do we want to um, sustain our, our growth? It's more about how we use the funds raised with the token launch. Is that what you're, what you're aiming for? Yes, well, because well, essentially you've said, you made it very clear about your distribution plan and how people are going, how much essentially of the overall token uh, allocation is going to be devoted to this public um, access yeah. point coming up. So you've made it clear that essentially that's going to happen. Um, what is interesting also is that you are going to act, um, allow the US to partake in this. That's not easy yeah. to do. So what was involved there to, to achieve that? Yeah, uh, lawyers were involved uh, in <laughs> doing that. <laughs> Well, you've done so, very well. Course, it's very difficult. Lawyers and no smart contracts. Yeah. yeah. Smart contracts. Yeah. At first, we thought it wouldn't be possible. That's why we went all the all the way from last year um, with excluding the U.S. And then our lawyers came up uh, with a plan uh, only a few weeks ago how we can manage to have U.S. accredited investors um, put into the uh, public sale. Mm -hmm. And um, to be honest, the U.S. is a very uh, interesting and it's a huge market for business integration. Mm -hmm. um, there are big companies there. Of course, it's 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 a really huge market. It's very important for us, mm -hmm. and we got uh, business-wise, we got a lot of contacts there, and there there are some customers uh, from from ours. So we took the chance, and they offered us. And as Stefan said, it's not so easy to set up. We will have to use a different software. We can't use our web wallet we use for all the other countries. Mm -hmm. It has to be something different. Our token sale agreement has to be adjusted. KYC okay, uh, is different. KYC, of course, is, is different, mm -hmm. and that's all set up now, but it's still it's a little bit manual process, so that's why we have to divide it and put some portion of the uh, public token sale tokens into into the U.S. accredited investors mm -hmm. uh, portion to have them included too. I see. But and still, business, still the yeah. majority of the tokens will be in public sale, and that's something I, want, I always I also want to add. It's not about not only about selling tokens to raise like ether to put it in development. Of course, this is mm. this is one part of the idea to use the funds for development, template design, marketing, mm. and so on. But we also think that when it comes to the technical side of right. blockchain, and we are a techie uh, a yes. company, it's it's very hard for techie companies to do worldwide marketing unless you are Microsoft or Google, perhaps. So the chance to have the early adopters that really understand what blockchain is for, believing in your startup mm -hmm. and also spreading the word is marketing that you will never achieve on, a, on an old school way. If we mm -hmm. just with SPO print, make a new website, print some flyers and go to an exhibition somewhere in the world, then still we only would be a small light. Mm -hmm. But uh, being uh, using uh, the token launch and all the 
the community that is behind also so to spread the word about our ideas yes. is a very very yeah. big chance to be a first mover and and to also guarantee some value to the investors as well uh, mm. so we want to have the token launch as public as possible to um, yeah. Yeah. to focus on as many people as possible and I think that many people in the US would certainly appreciate that as well Stefan that they can participate because they quite simply haven't been able to in many instances for many projects uh, let's talk about now dates, Martin, in terms of when the, this crowd sale is, is proposed. Do you know? Yeah, the can, process, mm, sorry. yeah, it will start in two days at the 20th of April. Okay, so two days from 10th. now on the 20th of April. Yeah, it's That's not long. German time. Okay, it's all run on German time. I like that. It's going to be right on the dot then. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, fr Friday, two p.m. <laughs> German time is is nice yeah. also for for other participants. Right. And yeah. how long how long is it planned yeah. for? That's just you know that's just what I wanted to add. Uh, it will end at the twentieth uh, of May. Okay. Twentieth of May. Or, or of course it will end uh, suddenly when all the tokens are sold. Mm -hmm. If that would be before twentieth of May, these are the two options how to how the crowd sale. I see. Will end. And based on you know previous sentiment and action, are you optimistic that it's going to well and truly? Yeah, early? of course we are. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Of course we, we are optimistic. We, we are. We got great feedback. Mm -hmm. um, there was that that market dip. We um, yeah, we felt it too. Of course, people looking at the ether price and they they weren't sure where to go and so on. Mm -hmm. But um, especially at that very moment, um, we felt that with having a real product and a real vision, mm -hmm. people came to us and, and we, especially in that moment, get that, that positive feedback that it's a project where you really can make use of blockchain and where they can see the sense in it. Right. Um, yeah. well, well, let's explore that right now. Perfect segue. So thank you. Let's talk about clients. And then we'll move across to partners. Uh, the reason being that obviously you would have trialed this in as you you know develop this idea in terms of real use cases and real clients trying to utilize it. So how is that looking already? You have a long list in your uh, your your white paper right now. Very impressive from Samsung to Siemens to Lufthansa to Shell. It's impressive. Let's explore yeah. it even further. You two can tell us a lot more than anyone in the world. Yes, I, I could also use this to, to do a short add on the template idea, because mm -hmm. uh, when you asked uh, before how would a, a customer use it, then Martin started with he would choose one of our existing templates. Mm -hmm. And the existing templates are all inspired by integration projects we've done in the past with the clients you mentioned. Okay. So, um, of course, these sometimes it's it's like 10 or 12 years ago that some of these projects started, so blockchain was, was not there at all, uh, but still the integration and the process that we did was the inspiration for the template uh, towards blockchain. Right. So it will be, right. of course, it will be um, an intelligent move in our uh, in our view when we go for the existing customers um, that uh, that we already have to set them also up for the first pilot projects that face the blockchain extension. Mm -hmm. The same is true uh, for for our go to market partners, Kuka and Microsoft. Who also will try to uh, address um, their existing customer portfolio mm -hmm. and just take perhaps a project that's running for years and then explain them why it's good to solve the last perhaps remaining 10% yeah. unsolved with a blockchain sure. technology. And we are going to talk about the partners very soon so thanks for already starting to do that but what I wanted to ask was are there any other clients that you are already aware of that aren't listed in your white paper that are already pl you're planning to build out uh, your your project, your your enterprise plan, simply by having more lined up at the door. Yeah. Yes, especially when it comes to the pilot projects, because um, in, we already reached our soft cap, so we are able to to set up. Uh, we already started development mm -hmm. and extended the team as promised according to the roadmap. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, it's more up to us choosing the right pilot projects to showcase um, Unibride in the best possible way. Mm -hmm. So we. As Martin said, we have a lot of experience with with breweries, uh, brewery industry here in Germany, and we could of course pick three or four of our existing clients, mm -hmm. uh, but they would be all from the same industry and perhaps all facing the same use case. But what we want to do is mm -hmm. pick three completely different uh, industries and showcase different use cases and templates. Right. So it will be a mixture of our existing clients and also new clients that we attract only by being a blockchain company. Yeah? For mm. example, when we were in Dubai, uh, we were um, um, consulted by a 
company that's working in real estate and wants to have all their contracts done in by smart contracts in blockchain and mm -hmm. connecting their existing systems. So that's exactly what Unibright is about. So this would be also a, a great client to uh, to be one of the pilot customers. So right now we yep. can, we can tell which the pilot customers would be, and it will also depend mm -hmm. on the outcome of the token sale mm -hmm. if we get closer to the cap um, or somewhere in between. I see. And then right. we'll be very open concerning showcasing. Pilot. Yeah, but 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 the mm -hmm. overall picture, if I may just put in some numbers, is we will have two or three uh, pilot customers up and running in 2018, mm -hmm. and. As Stefan said, it's the mixture. We will take them from our old customers. And the whole idea is to have these pilot customers set up as, as a showcase. And we will take them with our partners like Microsoft and Silke, mm -hmm. on whom we are, will be talking soon, I guess. And we will then do events like a hackathon, which is already planned with Microsoft uh, and Unibright, with, uh, which will take place in May. Mm -hmm. We will take those events and then showcase what can be done with blockchain technology to other companies, to other CTOs we invite from European companies, because we are still in such an early uh, stage with mm -hmm. this technology. It's uh, sometimes it's taking them by their hand and, and, and showing them what is possible uh, with, with, with blockchain technology. It's, it's so early, so we have to do this kind of promotion um, on an enterprise level too, mm -hmm. um, showcasing what is, what is possible. Sure. So obviously, it being so nascent, you are very optimistic about having more uh, clients come on board very quickly. But let's talk now about the importance of the partners you do have. And one of them you've many, many times mentioned with regard to Microsoft. Clearly, things are brewing, no pun intended, with your brewery. But Microsoft is certainly linked to you very strongly. Let's talk about that. And let's talk about other partners that are really key to building out your platform. Yeah, I, I can elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, what we try to do with the token launch, I, I touched that before with this worldwide marketing and having this, this community effect, but we also aim for strategical partnerships and some kind of hybrid partnerships. Okay. So we don't have a, we don't have a single partner that's only doing one thing. We aim for partners that, that act on different levels. So for example, Microsoft Germany, um, of course, they are uh, a part of, of Microsoft, which is a, a fundamental base of our um, uh, technology, with our existing platform running on Azure with using .NET Framework. But they are also some kind of go-to-market partner showcasing uh, blockchain technology, the Unibright Framework, together with Microsoft technology to potential clients, like Martin said, with our common hackathon. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, they are also um, a partner that introduces us to other members of the Microsoft Partner Network, for right. example, for right. integration partners that could help us um, uh, guaranteeing the first level support or the technical support when it comes to installation. Mm -hmm. And I could elaborate very much on, on every on our partners. Zürcher, they are not only investors in the, in the seed round, but also mm -hmm. providing developing capacity, also uh, enabling events and helping us with go-to-market. So each of the partners we have on board has several roles and they are all somehow uh, also bound to the success of Unibride for the partnership to make sense to them. Okay, so it's interesting you've mentioned in detail, you even mentioned Azure, that element, that permission designed that Microsoft have created. I even read in your information that some could, you know, potentially er erroneously regarded as a competitor. So can we talk about Microsoft Azure? Um, the nature of permission blockchains and how other softwares are also doing something like what you're doing. And then let's talk about other competitors you're aware of and how you can address these concerns of the community. Yes, it's big questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, con yeah, concerning yeah. Microsoft Azure, um, it, it's also about what's intended to be and what's the reality in the end. You know, when you talk about decentralized systems, of course, you wouldn't recommend a cloud-based uh, platform in the very first uh, sentence. No. But still, uh, when you talk about existing ERP systems or, or cloud-based landscapes that enterprises already set up, you somehow have to integrate them. And our idea is if somebody really wants to be quick, if he thinks of, of his system as, um, as a satellite that's somehow centralized, but he has this decentralized component with a smart contract set up between him and the supplier, for example, it's then it's easier for him to rely on something like Azure, which mm -hmm. already enables all the technical stuff where you can easily uh, um, set up local nodes to either uh, Ethereum or Hyperledger or R3 Corda or whatever implementation you can think of. But they and are all again, privatized in that respect, aren't they? They are all permissioned. Yeah. yeah. They are, they are exactly. local nodes, yeah. Mm. 
and, and then uh, just um, the same argument as we have, uh, uh, concentrate on your process. Mm -hmm. Then we could argue if you already have set up a technical landscape, then the Azure part will do the, the technical integration and you can again focus on what you're actually doing right. instead of thinking right. how do I install a local node. Uh, no. That's not what the no. enterprise should spend too much time on. So clearly, Martin, yeah. it sounds like from what Stefan's saying is that you're not worried about other competitors or, or what other people are doing. You're focused on essentially your own objective. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think in, in this uh, field, it's, it's not so much about competition. It's much more about opportunities for us. It's about looking at, at other blockchain projects. And um, we, are, we are happy when we see other projects emerging, like let's say Sophia, TX or right. whatever projects. They try to set up some kind of standard in in, in, in one sector um, and having blockchain technology um, to work there. And for us, it's about looking what is working in different sector, what, what is the solution for which problem. Mm -hmm. And if we find one that is valuable, we will take it and integrate it into our platform and mm -hmm. have companies make use of this special platform. So let's take one example. Hyperledger is of, often mentioned. Hyperledger is clearly not, it's not a competitor to us. It's just a technology we offer. We have now framework mm -hmm. to set up private blockchains. And it's, it's all about integration here too. Mm -hmm. it's, it's helping companies make use of all these different approaches that are out there and that are coming day after day and others are going. And we take those that work uh, in our templates mm -hmm. that set a live blockchain technology and these we integrate in, into our framework. And I think you make a very good point too, Martin, because essentially what you're trying to do is provide a customized platform for the needs of every individual uh, client that comes to you. And to do that, you must have opportunities for permission as much as permissionless uh, blockchain options because some will need privatized data. If we could talk now about your team, how's that going in terms of your numbers? And if you could tell us what the, the overall expertise is and the skill sets of your team without going into individuals. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the core team consists of um, integration specialists and computer mm -hmm. scientists. Mm -hmm. And um, as we said, we already uh, exceeded the soft cap and started extending the team. Mm -hmm. And we work on three different um, levels here. We have a pure front end development team that's focusing on the visual tools. Yep. Uh, yep. We have like a back end development team that goes more for the connecting part, uh, also of our existing integration platform. That, and they see blockchain more like just a technology that has somehow to be integrated te technology wise as a given and the third part <laughs> and the third part is yeah. the code generation and the architectural part of it mm -hmm. and for all three teams we already started um, hiring and started extending the team right um, so right. Uh, apart from the seven core uh, team members that show up on the website we also have five more that are not uh, yeah not showing up in public because they don't want or we don't want to present them and uh, to headhunters and telling them we have the solidity specialist here. So the core team of 12 members that existing is now already extended, uh, extended by um, yeah. uh, talking from, from now today like 10 more people. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think if we, if we would have done this interview one week later, then it would be uh, another two or three. Mm -hmm. I think there is a natural... Um, natural target to go for. It's not that you are as double as fast when mm -hmm. you have 30 developers compared to 15. Uh, but I think we'll need some more extension in the team um, still. Mm -hmm. But we are already working on that and we're uh, also already ahead of our roadmap. Concern. Okay, well, let perfect segue as well into the roadmap itself. And what's exciting and what many people look for, and quite rightly so, is some kind of evidence, some tangible evidence of your software. Uh, and certainly you have a demo available. I have seen it online. Um, can you tell us a bit more about where you are situated with your roadmap and at what point where we see the alpha or beta and, and you know, uh, the rollout of your actual you know, product? Yeah. yeah, we're exactly there um, where it's pointed out in the roadmap in Q2 2018. Um, you can see the video walkthrough on our website as you just uh, mentioned it. Mm -hmm. um, the tools are ready to use. Um, our integration platform at the moment connects SAP systems with Ethereum blockchains. That's our pilot product, our, our minimum viable product. Mm -hmm. All the visual tools are working too. Um, and as we uh, stated in the, in the roadmap, the idea is to um, grow horizontally to add more blockchains that we support, like Hyperledger, uh, NEM might be one 
mm -hmm. uh, which, which is very interesting. And um, looking at ERP systems, of course, we will support Microsoft systems, Navision, Dynamics, uh, looking into, into Oracle systems too. Right. Um, Business-wise, as I said, we will have two, two or three pilot customers in uh, 2018 up and running. And the aim is for 2019 to have the complete product ready and support uh, much more than only Ethereum, but much more blockchains and support more ERP systems like we currently do. I say yes. And if, if, if I may add, the, the interesting thing is compared to other projects, the connector part of our Unibright framework is the existing integration platform technique. Mm -hmm. And this is up and running. So it's more than a prototype and it somehow it shouldn't appear on the roadmap because it just exists. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. many people, of course, rely on the progress of a product when it comes to front end. Right. I can totally right. understand that because it's easier to 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 feel what's actually going on if you can if you can drag and drop some visual components. Mm -hmm. But this is only one part of the complete framework. So our target for Q2 is to have the first demos of this also uh, up and running for the for making beta tests by the public, so right. to say. Uh, but it's very important to understand that the core parts of this of our system, so the connecting parts and also the code generation parts, um, are already uh, very far architectural and implementation wise. But it's nothing that that you can so show so easily to to somebody who's not into coding or setting up server environments. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have to focus on the front end components to show progress here. But it's only one part of the picture. I see. But it is great that people can already see currently what you are doing. That's an imperative as you build. Is there plans yep. to continue that transparency and show people more and more of what you'll be doing? Yeah, we we have to exactly mm -hmm. when we. When our mm -hmm. argument is that we will present audited smart contract code, mm -hmm. then of course people have to work with our yeah. workflow designer and see the code that comes out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's not a, a marketing strategy to be transparent. It's vital for the uh, for showing the quality level of the code we provide. So we mm -hmm. will surely be uh, transparent on that. Great. Yeah. Well, if we could if we could talk now about some of the more challenging things, and that is the criticisms perhaps already have been uh, th thrown around in the crypto space. If we could now talk yeah. about you know, your focus on advisors. I did want to talk to you about that because you have quite a few in in your design, in, in your team. So why did you choose to have so many advisors in your, particularly with regard to crypto and in, and uh, ICO, you know, monitoring and support? You have three. Yeah. Yeah, I guess about the advisors, it's, it's some kind of process too. Uh, not all of them were there when we started the process um, or the project. Uh, when we started the project, we had mainly people from the from the business world, like consultants or uh, data model modeling specialists, um, SAP speci specialists, and then we moved on and we got um, Alexei from from Ambisafe, mm -hmm. who is a whitehead hacker. He's well known, an Ethereum security specialist. Um, we we went into the crypto scene and um, at first we handled all the contacts to all the people in the crypto scene ourselves. Mm -hmm. And at one point in time, we 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 saw we couldn't do it. And that's when uh, Philip and Gabor joined uh, our advisory board, and they now they handle all the uh, I don't know conferences and contacts and everything that goes in the crypto scene, because uh, it's a lot of work to do there. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of um, talks to do and chats to do. That's what they uh, do for us. Um, recently, okay, uh, Nicholas Merton um, yes. joined the team. Data Dash. Um, he's uh, he joined us. I think he's got the same vision. We share the same vision here on blockchain technology, uh, on what it might enable. And it, it's great to talk with him and um, see the big picture. And he helps us um, in setting up the strategy uh, on how to move, and move on and on which blockchains to look, on which technologies to look. And mm. yeah, it's, it's, it's he's, like- He's certainly well known, that's for sure. You've chosen one of the most famous people to you know, have representation from this area. So kudos to you also, and, and well done to Nick. For taking part but if we could all, um, move across now to final statements as well martin no doubt there are things that you both want to say uh, on behalf of your team of unibright to the wider audience and what would it be firstly might start with you stefan and then finish off with martin yeah um, first of all i would like to to thank everybody watching for the interest not only in in your uh, great channel but also in uh, such a techie product like uh, like Unibright offers, and the, the most important for me in this in this in these crazy times that we are in with uh, marketing and token launch is to see how many people 
that are around that really have the big picture of blockchain and technology. And I think 99% of the enterprises we are addressing with our framework would be very happy to have uh, many of these clever people in their advisory board mm. because they are just like literally two or ye uh, three years ahead of what the knowledge in um, in the enterprises are. So I just want to say that I'm really impressed the, the more we dive into this crypto space, how, how good the due diligence of every um, single investor is and the questions we are asked also help us to to be better so i think yeah. two days before the crowd sale this would be the perfect situation to to say thank you to all of those who put questions to us and give us the chance to improve on our product and it's great i think it's great that you're addressing just the education side of crypto because i think it's understated and certainly we want the best for every great project there are not great pro not not a lot of great projects out there but for those that do they do require uh, a, lot, a very robust uh, debate and conversation, and I hope that we have brought that forward today. That was the intention. So, Martin, with regard to any final statements you want to make, what would you like to say to the audience? Yeah, I think uh, what came into my mind first is the community too. Um, I think it's it's us being educated by the community often. They are so great uh, yeah, inputs by, by people uh, in our Telegram group or uh, writing us emails or meeting them in conferences. I think the people we meet, they are so fascinated by blockchain technology and they sometimes they dive so deeply, uh, um, dive so deeply in, in, into our project and um, discuss all the, the features and the details. And it's, it's so great doing this. And I would like to encourage everyone um, to keep, keep up doing this because I think blockchain is something that is the technology that needs a big network, it needs a big community. Mm -hmm. And it's it's really great to be part of it and to to feel the others around us. Uh, that's that's great. And I'd like to say thank you. I'm sure that all the people appreciate it. So guys, if you have been on Telegram or any of the social media channels that Unibright offer, that 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 thanks was for you. And certainly, if you haven't been, there are social media channels to engage with. Thanks to the setup that they've uh, provided. So once again, Unibright is essentially the unified framework for blockchain-based business integration. Integration being the fundamental word, something that is arguably from these gentlemen essential for the move into the decentralized space and very imperative for businesses to be able to utilize such very innovative technologies for the future to maintain their relevance in 2018 and beyond. So on behalf of all the people of the world who wanted to know more about Unibright, thank you very much, both of you. I sincerely appreciate this has been a long one. I hope that uh, it's challenged you. I hope that it's also allowed you to really elicit the excellence that you represent. It was Thank really so great, it was interesting, and it was on targeting all levels you could think of. So thank <laughs> yeah. you for that. No problem. <laughs> thank, thank, you. You. thank you so much for the discussion. I think I, think I, I learned some, some new uh, features too. Thanks. <laughs> You're very welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs>